Hello, and welcome to Chicago Reacts, Americans Learn. My name is Colin, and today I'm watching Apollo Program, One Giant Leap. And this is uh, part two in a four-part series about the Apollo mission uh, made by the uh, awesome channel Epic History TV. And uh, so if you haven't seen the first one, go back and watch that and uh, come back here. Um, so the last video ended with the first um, mission around the moon. They haven't landed yet, but they were the first mission uh, to actually orbit the moon or I guess orbit. Yeah, just go around the moon. You know, they took some pictures. That's where the um, famous picture of the moon or of the Earth above the uh, moon's horizon. Um, very cool picture. And uh, yeah, I thought I would do this uh, series given that the Artemis mission, you know, is kind of up in swing. They just announced the uh, astronauts uh, that are going to be a part of that mission uh, like a, like last week, a few days ago, something like that. Um, so I thought it might be kind of fun to revisit how we got that the first time. You know, I think space is pretty cool. And uh, it's been a while since I've, you know, learned about the Apollo mission, and there's a lot that I've forgotten. Um, so this will be a, a nice refresher. So come along this journey with me, shall we? Uh, I'm sure there's probably a lot of stuff that I don't know about that we'll learn about. So uh, with that being said, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And I'm going to bring up the share screen here, and let's go. The way to the stars is open. 1961. At the height of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. Just weeks later, the United States launched its first astronaut, Alan Shepard. Point five, Kevin. Oxygen, go. All systems are go. He was welcomed home as a hero. But President John F. Kennedy knew that if the United States was to overtake the Soviet space program, it needed a bolder mission. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. As Kennedy addressed Congress, the United States had just 15 minutes of human spaceflight experience. No one knew if a moon landing was even possible, let alone in just nine years. It would be an unprecedented engineering and scientific undertaking, marked by heroism and tragedy. The incredible task of landing an astronaut on the moon would be known as the Apollo program. The Apollo program had been rocked by the tragic death of Apollo 1 astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. But it had recovered with the brilliant success of Apollo 7, the first crude test of the command and service module. And in 1968, after seven years of intense research and development, NASA had flown three astronauts 240,000 miles from home and into lunar orbit. Apollo 8 flew within 69 miles of the moon's surface, but crossing that final gap would be the greatest challenge of the Apollo program. It would require a completely new and untested type of spacecraft, the lunar module. This video is sponsored by Curiosity Stream home to thousands of online documentaries about science, technology, the natural world, and history. Their history section has hundreds of titles covering everything from early man and prehistory to the world wars and beyond. This time, we'd like to recommend a new documentary to their service, Napoleon's Legendary Spy, a revealing account of the career of Karl Schulmeister, a German smuggler who became a French double agent and spy master and helped Napoleon to pull off some of his greatest victories. Curiosity Stream features many award-winning exclusives and originals, and all its content can be streamed to any device, so you can watch at any time, anywhere. 
You can sign up on your smart TV using the code EPIC HISTORY to get access to this incredible range of documentaries for less than $15 for the entire year. You can also sign up using the link in our video description. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. Has anyone in the comments or, or anyone who's watching this, have you, have you guys ever checked out Curiosity Stream? If so, did you watch anything good? If, if you did, let me know in the comments. I haven't checked it out before, but I might. I keep watching these videos and they, they're they a uh, regular sponsor of uh, Epic History TV. So, I'm a little tempted now. Anywho, let's keep going. Looking back, we were the luckiest people in the world. There was no choice but to be pioneers, no time to be beginners. In the wake of Apollo 8's daring journey to the moon, Apollo 9 received much less public attention. The mission wasn't even going to leave Earth orbit. But within the astronaut corps, the first crewed flight of the lunar module was seen as an even more exciting challenge. The mission's commander, Jim McDivitt, had actually turned down the chance to fly to the moon on Apollo 8, choosing Apollo 9 instead. Like many Apollo astronauts, he was a former test pilot, and this was a chance to test a brand new flying machine. Two, one, zero, liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Before the test flight of the lunar module could begin, the crew had a challenging docking maneuver to perform. The lunar module was folded inside the upper stage of the Saturn V rocket needed to be extracted using the command and service module. Roger, Houston, uh, we're about 25 feet now on the closing board. Oh, Houston, we're hard back. I'm, I, I've seen this type of maneuver, you know, the docking maneuver in movies and TV and stuff like that. I've, I'm probably seen like actual video clips like this of, of it in action. But I, I like, I can't, fathom like how that's possible to do like I, I know they got like cameras and instruments to guide them in there but for such a small I mean well it looks small I'm, I don't know how big that is I'm assuming it's big enough for someone to kind of fly through so uh, I'm not even gonna guess but like yeah I don't know that 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 is a skill that, I, that baffles me I'm I'm kerfuffled I guess I, it's very impressive. All of this, all of going to space is very impressive, but this is just one thing that I wanted to point out, I guess, since they're showing it. Let's keep going. Good show. Leaving Command Module Pilot Dave Scott to fly the CSM, McDivitt and Lunar Module Pilot Rusty Schweikert climbed aboard and undocked. The Lunar Module was the first true spaceship designed only to fly in the vacuum of space. Its insect-like body was designed without the constraints of aerodynamics, but every panel, bolt and button had to be as light as possible so the craft could lift itself off the moon's surface. McDivitt said that it looked like cellophane and tinfoil put together with scotch. I was actually just about to say that, like given how expensive and meticulously worked on this this lunar craft uh the lunar module you know how much work went into that it does look like uh i don't know high school science project or not even, not even high school like elementary school project it, it looks like tinfoil and cellophane like the guy said but it got to the moon like i don't know looks to be deceiving i guess <laughs> tape and staples. He gave his craft the call sign Spider. Unlike the command module, Spider did not have a heat shield, so it would burn up if it tried to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. So if the astronauts couldn't redock with the command module after their test flight, they would have no way of returning home. But Spider's test flight went perfectly. McDivitt so like what? What actually would have happened, you know, like if they were unable, 
the lunar craft, the lunar module wasn't able to connect back, you know, would they just be stranded up in space f until they ran out of food and oxygen? Or, like, was there a contingency plan of them, like, crashing into the moon's surface or, or flying back to Earth to crash, like, somehow? What is the plan? That's horrifying, honestly, if you think about it. Yeesh. Lost in space. <laughs> and Schweikert flew the lunar module over 100 miles from the command module. They tested the ascent and descent engines and returned for a safe rendezvous. The lunar module was ready to fly to the moon. NASA had successfully tested both the command module and lunar module and made a trip around the moon. Many hoped the next mission would attempt the first moon landing. But NASA needed more experience in communications and tracking two separate spacecraft in lunar orbit, plus the challenges of rendezvous and docking in the Moon's weaker gravity. And there was another critical unknown. In 1968, NASA scientists discovered that the Moon has a highly uneven gravitational field. This is caused by huge lumps of high-density material in its crust known as mass concentrations, or mascons, which could exert an uneven pull on a spacecraft and throw it off course. I didn't know that about the moon. Before it was safe to attempt a landing, NASA would need to learn more about the mascons by examining their effect on another Apollo flight. Apollo 10 would be a dress rehearsal for the first landing attempt, flying every part of the mission, except for the final descent to the surface. The Apollo 10 crew was Commander Tom Stafford, Command Module Pilot John Young, and Lunar Module Pilot Gene Cernan. All three men were veterans of the Gemini program, and with five missions between them, they were the most experienced crew ever sent into space. Stafford and Cernan flew the Lunar Module to within nine miles of the Moon's surface. Their successful flight proved every phase of the mission, except for the final descent. I, now I think um, one of the things I, I'm looking forward to uh, with the Artemis mission going back to the moon is getting, hopefully they're gonna bring good quality, high definition cameras like with them to be able to photograph and film the lunar surface like it, in HD, because that would be incredible. Like what a great opportunity to like film something like that and then like film it in a what do you call IMAX? I would definitely buy tickets to that one. Um, yeah, I just find the moon fascinating. I would love to see it up close and in person. Like just a little flyby like that, you know? Why can't I be a billionaire? <laughs> Create my own space uh, engineering company and go to the moon myself. One day I will hit the lottery, I guess. I'll, I'll, I'll keep, uh, keep trying the scratch-offs. Now, everything was in place. It was time to attempt the landing. Apollo 11 would be commanded by Neil Armstrong, a brilliant engineer and test pilot. Early in his NASA career, he'd flown the experimental X-15 rocket plane up to an altitude of 207,000 oh feet. But Does that thing have wings? Or is it just a... I mean, I see the, the kind of smaller wings in front of the tail, but, like, is that just the angle of the picture? Or is it... it, it they don't have, like, the kind of traditional wings of, of a plane. If you know more about this this particular plane, let me know in the comments. I, I don't think I've ever heard of this one before. Very cool. At speeds of almost 4,000 miles per hour. Or, you know what? Actually, it does kind of remind me of uh, those model uh, rockets. And I think there was one like this that you could, like, set off as a kid, you know? Um, with adult supervision, of course. Um, but it looks, it kind of looks like 
one of those. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. I'm I'm sure, given the where this particular, uh, what do you say, rocket jet, um, where that lies in history, there's probably models of it somewhere and ones that you could probably fly, or at least shoot into the sky. <laughs> I want to get one of those again. Those are fun. Are they, are those, are those still legal? Or I I grew up in Southern California. I think they became illegal at some point because of the fires, but uh. Yeah. When he joined the space program as part of NASA's second astronaut group, he was one of the few astronauts to be offered a command on his first mission, Gemini 8. Gemini 8 achieved the first docking of two spacecraft in orbit. But the mission almost ended in disaster when a faulty maneuvering thruster caused the Gemini capsule to spin wildly. Armstrong's calm and swift piloting brought the spacecraft under control, and although the mission was cut short, he'd proved his almost superhuman ability to remain calm under pressure. Joining him as Lunar Module Pilot was Buzz Aldrin. A graduate of MIT, Aldrin wrote his doctoral thesis on piloting techniques for orbital rendezvous, and had an extraordinary understanding of orbital mechanics. He'd proven his expertise on Gemini 12. When the spacecraft's rendezvous radar malfunctioned, he was able to compute the orbital maneuvers himself and guide the capsule to a successful docking with an unmanned target rocket. The command module pilot was Michael Collins. He would remain aboard the command module whilst Armstrong and Aldrin descended to the moon. He had no regrets about his assignment, telling reporters that he was going 99.9% .9 of the way there, and that was fine with him. But years later, he would recount his greatest fear, that Armstrong and Aldrin would be stranded on the surface, leaving him to travel back to Earth alone. The 15th of July, 1969. Almost a million people were gathering at Cape Kennedy to watch the three astronauts fly to the moon. But not everyone was there to celebrate. A rat done bit, a rat done bit my sister, Nell, with uh, Whitney on the moon. Her face and arms began to swell, and Whitney's on the moon. <laughs> Is that a, okay, yeah, sounds like, I, I don't think I've heard that song. Is that a song or a poem? I don't think I've heard that before. Gil Scott. Aaron. <laughs> Rat done bit my sister nail. As launch preparations were made, around 150 people, mostly African American mothers and their children, arrived at Cape Kennedy to protest the launch. They were led by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, who had succeeded Dr. Martin Luther King as leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference after King's assassination the previous year. Their message was simple. It was inhuman to spend billions of dollars sending men to the moon, while one in five Americans lacked proper food, shelter, and health care. NASA Administrator Thomas Paine met with the protesters the evening before the launch. He told Abernathy that if we could solve the problems of poverty by not pushing the button to launch men to the moon tomorrow, then we would not push that button. Their terse meeting resolved nothing, but it ended with a handshake and a promise by Abernathy that he would pray for the safe flight of the astronauts. The following day, 10 of the protesters were invited into the VIP stands to watch the launch of Apollo 11. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Four days later, on the 20th of July, Armstrong and Aldrin climbed into their lunar module, call sign Eagle and began their descent to the lunar surface. 
Years of hard work and training had led to this moment. The descent to the lunar surface would test their skills to the very limit. Back on Earth, in Houston, Texas, the staff of Mission Control watched as Eagle passed behind the Moon for a final time. They monitored every system in both spacecraft and guided the astronauts through the complex flight plan. And the success of the mission was about to rest on the shoulders of 26-year-old guidance officer Steve Bales. 12.02, The master alarm sounded in the lunar module cockpit. Eagle's guidance computer was trying to tell the astronauts that something was wrong. Its simple display showed the numbers 1202, but neither Armstrong or Aldrin knew what this meant. That seems like something you should be trained on before taking on a mission like this, right? Like, but I guess that's why they have mission control, right? Don't don't know what that means, but uh, yeah, let's see, let's find out what 1202 means. Uh, on the Flight director Gene Krantz was seconds away from calling an abort. He turned to Bales for answers. 12.02 meant the guidance computer was overloaded. It had too many tasks to complete in its computing cycle, and was dropping some in order to continue functioning. Without a working guidance computer, the astronauts would have to abort. But the alarm wasn't sounding continuously. This meant that most computational cycles were being completed properly. Bales decided that as long as the problem was only intermittent, the landing could continue. We're going that flight. To the dust reoccur when we go. But then another problem. The lunar module was approaching the surface too fast and had overshot its intended landing site. Now, the computer was guiding them towards a massive, football stadium-sized crater, surrounded by a field of car-sized boulders. With the lunar module almost out of fuel, Armstrong took manual control. Mission control could only watch. The landing rested on Armstrong's piloting skills. God, and like... Without the... the the guidance controls and they are already overshot their intended landing position like this is i mean neil armstrong had, had already demonstrated that he can <laughs> handle life or death situations pretty calmly but my god like how i i am not built to withstand that kind of pressure i'll just say that yeah Lights on. Four forward, drift to the right a little. Down and a half. 30 seconds forward. Contact light. And quality base here. The Eagle has landed. As around 600 million people watched from Earth, Armstrong took his first steps on the lunar surface. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The precisely choreographed moonwalk had taken two years to plan. For two hours and 40 minutes, Armstrong and Aldrin gathered rock samples, set up scientific experiments, and took photographs. The Apollo 11 crew returned home as heroes. Their names now amongst those of the greatest explorers in history. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. Now that President Kennedy's goal had been accomplished, was there any point in returning to the moon? What was left for the Apollo program to achieve? The new mission would be science. 
the Moon's origins remained a mystery. Where did it come from? Could its scarred surface tell the story of the early solar system? And in turn, help us understand the origins of our own world? But although NASA now possessed the knowledge and technology to land on the Moon, it would soon receive a powerful reminder of the dangers of spaceflight. What was that? I guess we'll learn next. Thank time. you to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video, and to our Patreon supporters for making Epic History TV possible. Visit our Patreon page to find out how you can support the channel, get ad-free early access, and help to choose future topics. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter for extra Epic History content and regular updates. Alrighty, so there you have it. Um, that's how we got to the moon. <laughs> um, yeah, so super cool. I I'll admit, I, I don't know much about Apollo 12. I Everything I know about Apollo 13, I pretty much know from the movie. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what Epic History TV has to say about those particular missions. Um, I'll definitely learn something new with uh, Apollo 12, uh, and uh, Apollo 13, we'll just have to find out. Uh, if there's anything the movie left out or likely, you know, didn't get quite right, as most movies do. You know, they gotta tell a story. It's, you know, self seats. So, uh, it's not always gonna be entirely accurate. But anywho, I hope you enjoyed, uh, this video here, uh, from Epic History TV and, uh, about the Apollo mission. Uh, if you wanna make sure that you get notified for the next uh video in, in this series that comes out be sure to like share and subscribe and uh why don't you give a uh, epic history tv a like share and subscribe as well they put out great content and i literally would not be here if uh if it weren't for them um so yeah thanks everyone and uh i'll see you next time